Hi, Jeff. Zach, how are you guys doing? Hey, Steve. Hey. Thanks for having us. Good to have you. Well, we're talking today about the return of Japan real estate investors. Um, us folks with gray hair may remember the late 80s where the Japanese came in and they were buying a bunch of high profile properties, trophy properties like uh, New York's Rockefeller Center. Um, and they really didn't have a good go of things. Um, now they're back and they're taking a different approach of a more diversified approach, not necessarily focusing on trophy assets. Um, in 2023, we saw Japanese investors put 3.7 billion into commercial real estate um, into America, you know, biggest volume since 2016. Um, in the first 10 months of 2023, Japan was number five globally in terms of cross-border investments in commercial real estate. Uh, you know, some of your guys' thoughts on this new approach we're seeing from Japan after kind of getting burned the first time um, as uh, big time global real estate investors. Well, you forgot yeah. Nakatomi Plaza. I was <laughs> I was literally looking that up. I was trying to. And I just watched that a few times because, you know, it's a Christmas movie. So yeah. you know, I, I'll, I'll, I'll have a, a argument with anybody that wants to argue that's not a Christmas movie anytime. But um, you know, the, the truth is, Steve, I, I don't know what commentary I want to give on this. There are so many different points here. Um, misvaluing assets based on cap rates and interest rates, um, not diversifying and building a portfolio properly. Um, I mean, there's there's a lot of key mistakes that they made that, you know, we have, you know, education and information on that we do inside of our own business and we do for our investors. Um, you know, I'm, I, the takeaway here is that there were a lot of mistakes. A lot of the balls got dropped or every ball got dropped for that matter. So, you know, it's kind of interesting to uh, kind of dig into that. Yeah. I mean, I, hell, I, I'll, I'll take a stab at diversification, right? Because it's sometimes hard to to know what's going to happen. Even if you think you have a crystal ball. I mean, I, we've, we've seen uh, strip malls, a, a pretty unloved category not too long ago, doing really, really well post COVID as more people are taking short trips to the store, maybe spend some time from work from home closer uh, and wanting more of that that convenience. Um, and, and I don't know a lot of people who really saw that um, coming, um, but a properly diversified portfolio is going to have some retail in it, even, even when everybody's saying retail, it, it, you know, you, you don't want to own. Um, you know, I'll, I'll kind of throw out the importance of diversification here is, is one thing the Japanese didn't do when they were just buying trophy assets. You know, I'd add to it too. Um, I'm I'm kind of in the same boat with Zach. I'm not 100% sure what I want to say about it. You know, if you look at the real estate industry as a whole, there are very few um, owners, asset managers, et cetera, that buy or diversify their their portfolio. Most of them, like you know, multifamily people are multifamily buyers. That's all they do. They're only at they're only office buyers. They're only retail buyers. Um, and, you know, and I, I venture to say that's probably, and I, this is a shameless plug, but that's probably where we do this a little bit better is, you know, we've looked at it from the financial side when we were, you know, when we were lenders and, you know, running and managing these, and managing these properties and seeing what people are doing. I think it's hard for people to diversify because they think they mm -hmm. are, you know, they're experts in one particular asset class and they don't know how to. In this case, it looks like, you know, by the article to me that, you know, Japanese are coming in buying various asset classes and various um, subclasses of those asset classes to really diversify. Um, it, it's something interesting to look at and try to understand, but I'm not 100% sure I know exactly how to educate somebody on it. Well, here's here's the thing. I mean, you can dig into cap rates and we can talk about interest rates and cap rates and the correlation there. We can pick one of these assets. We can dissect how they valued it and maybe where they miss. Uh, misvalued the properties that they originally sure. buying. We could build a diversified portfolio. I mean, we can talk about how the different asset classes of real estate tie together and how they balance each other out so that you're not a one trick pony. Um, you know, really, I, I would leave it up to our viewers. You know, what do you want us to educate you on? Leave a comment. The, the highest rated comment, we'll make a video on it and we'll, we'll make an educational piece around what you want to know. For sure. Yeah, I, I think cap rates is a great, topic right there um you know we'll, we'll probably cover that at, at some point and you know it's not as simple as just buying what's cheapest right i mean th there's reason to look at what's cheapest but sometimes it's cheap for a reason right um you know you would expect uh, a lot of traditional malls to be cheaper 
um, than say um, the kind of new wave of mixed use property that has a retail component to it because one seems to be dying um, and the other one seems to be flourishing. So yeah, you would expect one to be cheaper than the other. With that said, at a certain level of cheapness, uh, what we are seeing people buying traditional malls just because the land's worth a lot of times a lot. It's a lot of times just on a premium location. So it gets cheap enough. It can make sense to just raise the property um, and put something new up there. Um, you know, and, and I think that's another component here is it, it, it's not as simple as just looking at what's cheap or what's expensive. Um, it, you know, you, there's a real art here to, to figure out at what point does it does it make sense that I also think, you, you know, the Japanese their first time around, um, there was an immaturity or a lack of sophistication there. Well, I can I can also talk about in terms of your malls um, that could also be due to a landlord or a property manager doing leasing better. I mean, there are um, leasing structures in retail where there are net of sales, there are uh, break points, there are other things where um, you can make leases cheap enough that businesses will survive and be able to afford the rent, but then they have to pay it out of profits. And that's another educational piece we can talk about is how leases are structured because that's in offices, that's in residential units to a certain degree too. Uh, we can talk about landlords, we can talk about property management companies um, because there's there's an art that was missing from the Japanese as owners. I would, I would wager a guess that they were not structuring or their leases, they were not paying attention to how they uh, staggered their leases and their expiration dates uh, so they didn't have concentration risk in their own buildings. And that's an art form. Here. That's an art form in itself. So sorry, Jeff, go go for it. Grab the no, lady. I mean, it, it, it's funny so because in my mind, what I was I was thinking, as Steve said, retail and specifically related to big malls is, you know, I think a lot of times, um, you know, seeing that something is, quote unquote, falling by the wayside or is a dying asset is is actually a reason maybe to to jump in you know when everybody else is selling maybe you maybe you dive in because truthfully in my mind there is a there is another use for that space you don't have to develop it you have to redevelop it and there's something that could be used for um you know and i think part of it is maybe it stays where it is as well it's like maybe maybe you get better at managing the property managing your leases you, know, you can buy it cheaper you don't have to do the same traditional leases you can get creative and make a property that worth that much more so that down the line, somebody who thinks they are a better retail operator comes in and buys it and changes it back and screws it up and you can buy it again. Well, redevelopment, that was a key word right there. And there is a way to look at an asset differently than what it is and to figure out what the highest and best use would be. That's another educational topic that we can make a whole series on. So For sure. again, this is this is interesting um, and, and it looks like they've kind of righted the ship a little bit. They're buying diversified assets and uh, diversified valued um you know asset classes so it's like class a b c uh so it looks like they kind of they figured it out a little bit but you know let us let us know what we should make a video on let us know what educational content you guys want us to make leave us a comment and we'll make uh we'll make a video on yeah and i would just say you know one of the lessons here is uh it's not simple which the japanese learned it's not as simple as picking one class that seems to be doing well and then just putting everything in that class whether it's it's multifamily, whether it's trophy buildings um <laughs> whether it's cryptocurrencies or dot-com stocks <laughs> or dutch tulip bulbs um you know one lesson we have from history is when something's hot it, it, it generally stays hot for a while um but uh, eventually um it comes down and, and and it can be ugly when it comes down um and and that's a big lesson for diversification. And well, now, yeah, I, I sorry. Last point I'd make on it, too, is, you know, is, is understanding what the you know, what the the quote unquote investor in this case, Japan was looking to do at the 80s and what they are looking to do now could be two and diff, two completely different investment strategies. One is, you know, of course, I don't want to lose. Um, but the other one may have just been about, you know, buy it, hold it because they just attributed the value to U.S. real estate as something that couldn't lose based off the value of the dollar. Yeah, and they had their own property bubble and stuff. I think they kind of had a, sure. a, a back then. They kind of had a, a there was a, there were a few things going on, including um, you know pressure for them to deploy um, funds outside Japan, pressure um, to capture uh, you know th those returns overseas, um, a, as well as kind of an investment mania that was going on with Japan in the eighties. Um, and we shouldn't be too judgmental of that, about that, of course, post our subprime crisis, because it, it, it you know, and post our crypto crisis, these manias impact smart people. Um, well, as look, well they, as gave us a, they gave us an, another mania out of it. They gave us diehard. So, you know, there is that. Side. <laughs> there you go.
<laughs> okay. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Thanks, Steve.